Welcome, friends, to the Followers of the Way Bible Study. It's good to be with you, and I'm grateful that I'm joined by the Reverends Michael Peacock, Nicole Abnor, and Will Wellman as we come together to talk about a Bible passage for the Sunday ahead of us. The Sunday ahead of us in the church liturgical year is Pentecost, and so the readings will all seek in some way to speak about the gift of God's Holy Spirit. I've chosen to use the suggested gospel reading from the lectionary, which continues us for one more Sunday in John's gospel in the um, extended soliloquy of Jesus as he's gathered with the disciples in the upper room. Of course, Pentecost Sunday is a Sunday when everybody will likely, if they come to church at all, whether it's virtually or in person, will hear the first portion of the second chapter of Acts read. And um, that's the story of Pentecost at the early church. But the gospel readings, of course, all precede that. And so any gospel reading which speaks to the Spirit has to be before that Pentecost moment. So we'll stay the course with this gospel reading, which has been chosen by the lectionary scholars and suggested to the church around the world, because in their view, in some way, it speaks to this Pentecost theme and the gift of the Spirit in the life of the church. The Followers of the Way is a Bible study of 25 years, and it had met in person in the fellowship hall at the Pomacia Presbyterian Church, but it's been an ecumenical Bible study with uh, participants from a number of different Christian traditions. And we have continued online in the pandemic, and uh, it has continued to grow in that ecumenical uh, status as folks online have, from a number of different traditions, shared in it and sent us comments. We appreciate your comments. They help us. So feel free to email them to me at john at pomacea.org. Your questions, your um, suggestions, your proposals different than ours, your observations, and I'll be glad to share it with them with uh, Will, Nicole, and Michael. It's a wonderful thing at the beginning of the week to gather and study of the scripture. It's um, even more precious when we are able to proceed it with prayer. And so um, I'm grateful that Nicole has offered to open us with prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift and the beauty of this day, for the opportunities that are present within it. We ask now, as we turn our attention to the gift of your word, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds to hear and receive the words you would have for us this day. We thank you for the community, for the community that engages in conversation around the interpretation of your word. It helps us, O oh God, as we seek to discern uh, the ways in which you would have us be your disciples. Be with us now, be a part of our conversations and the meditations of our hearts. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The reading comes from the last part of the 15th chapter of John and a number of verses into the 16th chapter. And Will is going to share it, and I've asked if he would read it as well. In the Gospel of John in the 15th and 16th chapter. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. 
for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This is beautiful language, um, but also we have heard it for a number of Sundays now. Um, and it certainly, um, you know, has gone on uh, across um, three fourths of May, really. And yesterday in your sermon at Palmasia Presbyterian, Nicole, you prefaced it by underscoring that this is a farewell a farewell speech from Jesus. And you asked us to imagine um, the notion of farewell. That seems to intersect for me really well with graduation, you know, and commencements. Um, I, there's something about um, the farewell moments and uh, in the church calendar and scriptures that uh, connects well with graduations and people making life changes that way. So I, I, I like that because it seemed to fit with what I see going on in a lot of people's lives. But in this farewell discourse of Jesus, um, he, he is both saying goodbye, and, and that's what you're suggesting, right? That he's saying goodbye to the disciples. And at the same time, he's talking to God. Have I got it right as you were experiencing it, or lifting it up? Uh, yes, particularly yesterday, he was talking to God because it was the portion of the uh, high priestly prayer uh, that he lifts up in chapter 17, uh, which is a part of the overall farewell discourse, which I think we would lay the parameters uh, as being the 14th through the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. I mean, that sort of is the larger process of Jesus uh, both saying goodbye um, and as a part of saying goodbye he does offer prayer for God um, part of his saying goodbye is preparing the disciples for the events that are going to transpire and take place and uh, the other part which I think that we encounter some today is uh, letting them know that he's not going to leave them alone uh, but letting them know that though he will no longer be physically present with them in the ways in which they've grown accustomed to, uh, that they will receive the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is a, is a part of this divine relationship that, that he himself is a part of and that that will be uh, the new experience of the divine for them. Yeah, you know, there's a, I don't wanna say an enigma, but um, a, a, a stretching way of thinking there um, because uh, it, it involves both the content of someone saying goodbye and yet also a promise that he won't leave them. Um, both of those are present at the same time. Am I right? Is that the way you're reading it? And that's... Uh, that's stretching, isn't it? I mean, there's a tension in that, right? Both, both the, I mean, there's a promise here in this passage that he will send them another expression that the Father will. Um, and, and yet is also the reality that the way in which they've been with him is going to change and they won't be with him in that way anymore. I'm just engaged with the fact that he's, He's trying to say it both ways uh, here. I, I think that's, uh, I think it's Jesus being comforting and I find it comforting. He's saying, I'm not gonna be with you, but don't worry, it's gonna be okay because I am still gonna be with you. And so I think he's intentionally trying to say it both ways to describe that physically he won't be, but in whatever non-physical sense he is referring to, and the disciples certainly don't understand that at that point, that he's going to continue to be with him by what we would call the Holy Spirit. 
you know, not, not only do the disciples not understand it at that point, but I have to work towards understanding at this point. I guess that's part of what's engaging for me is this is a promise and a reality outside of typical human experience, right? The, uh, the both saying farewell at the same time as one is saying, I will not abandon you. I will be with you. Not to push too hard on that, but do you all know any human parallel for this? I don't know any human parallel for it, but I think that it's probably not uncommon that perhaps people who are in whatever situation where they know that there is their impending death, much like Jesus knew at the time of this conversation, where in talking to family members or loved ones, uh, somebody might attempt to say, who realizes they're dying to say, I'm dying but I want you to know you can, however they choose to say it, by looking at the stars, by, by uh, listening to the birds, by whatever, when that occurs in your life, know that I'm with you in, in a manner similar to what Jesus did. And I don't think that's uncommon in my experience of dealing with people in pastoral situations. You know, I think you're right, Mike. And the two um, metaphors you used are, are ones that I have heard people use also. They're kind of classic the feel of the wind across your cheek. I'm using actual quotes from letters, even in antiquity. You know, when you hear the song of the birds, you know, that is me. But the, there's a difference. And, and, I, and I'm lingering around this because I think it's important that we be aware of it. Um, when people write that, they're speaking of what they do not know. I mean, they're making a promise that they haven't lived yet. You know, the person who has not yet died saying, when you feel the wind across your cheek, that is me drawing near you. Well, they haven't died. They don't know whether they're going to be able to be like the wind moving across their cheek, right? And so, uh, and the birds singing. So I, you're right. That is a deep human um, tendency. And that, I don't mean to generalize it too much, but at least it is not a strange uh, practice. It may not be common, but it isn't strange for people to, to make that promise and communicate that way. But Jesus here is, is claiming he does know um, that, that he has knowledge they don't have, that it comes from the Father, uh, from God, and he's naming it, you know, as the Spirit. Um, and he says in verse 26, when the advocate, and that word is translated, you know, many different ways, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. And, and so it's, it's a, a much more specific promise based on authority and knowledge that he claims to have here. I mean, we're right to say this is strange because we can't do this. Go ahead, Nicole. I was going to say, I was going to push back on you a little bit, John, in terms of the human experience, because I think that when, when people say, you know, when people say, you know, when you feel the breeze on your face, there's, they are saying that out of some personal experience. It's just the experience that of the other direction. Um, that is to say, I think that they say that when they themselves have experienced through the loss of a loved one, a very close, um, continued presence and connection with them, um, even though they no longer are physically accessible. I think they're, they are drawing on that. And I think that they draw in, in some ways, at least those who, um, who are Christians and have this understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit are drawing from ways in which they have encountered the very real presence of Christ in their midst even though they themselves have not had the physical encounter with Jesus the way the early disciples did. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it's our way, I think it's our way of trying to provide and articulate some language of things that we do experience, even though we cannot fully explain it. 
you, you know, I, I have, that's helpful, Nicole, and you're pushing me, and that's good. I, you said push back. When people say when you feel the breeze on your cheek, that's me drawing near you, they are saying that you're suggesting out of their own experience with having felt the breeze and having the sense in some epistemological sense, whether it's intuition, whether it's um, what else could it be, that, that someone is near them, a, a sense of presence. How do we know someone is present with us? You know, how do we know, underscoring no. And you're saying we, we have that experience and knowledge at times um, that someone is with us. Um, they are saying that out of their awareness. You're saying without saying what the basis for that knowledge is, except they have experienced it, right? And then you, and then you're so, yeah. positing that Christians that Christians have experience of Jesus with them um, mm -hmm. later. Yes, I've had people this week tell me, you know, that they felt the closeness of someone's presence with them who had died when they saw a, a particular bird near them. That might surprise you at first, but I report to you all, it is not unusual at all for me as a pastor, for people to report to me that they sense the presence of others through the appearance of birds. You know, have you all heard that uh, or experienced that before? It's a very tender and yeah. intimate thing people share, you know, but, and it, and it varies from person to person, but I do share with you, that is a report people bring me uh, uh, and, and I wonder if that's a part of, you know, the, the work of creation and, and the proximity to creation, but that's another way in which they report to me, they find that sense of connectedness coming to them. I think creation often is the manifestation of that, whether it's birds or um, I most recently, um, it was a butterfly. Um, and uh, different, I think just different appearances, things that there in which there were physical human connections and memories with a particular person that people draw on that then when those elements of creation reappear at significant moments, it is interpreted as I think the manifestation of the, of, of the person's presence with people. And all of that you're suggesting becomes a basis. Uh, uh, I, I won't say an authority, but a reality that provides a, a, an experience for us to help us understand what Jesus is promising here, right? Am I reading you correctly? I think so. I mean, for me it is, I don't know about Mike or Will. So I just read the verses again, starting with uh, 26 and 15. When the advocate comes, I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth. I will send to you. That's quite a promise. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Jesus is promising that he will send this to us. The spirit of truth, he names it, who comes from the Father, he connects it with God. He will testify on my behalf. The advocate will witness, will bear his own witness to um, the presence of Jesus, the reality of Jesus and the advocate. I mean, that, that language is so beautiful, we could just sort of roll past it. But to unpack it, Jesus is saying that uh, you're going to have an experience after I have left you of a presence coming to you, and I am sending that presence and that presence comes from the Father, I'm calling it the spirit of truth, and he will testify in some way, or she will testify, that, that spirit will testify in some way itself that it is connected with Jesus. It will bear its own testimony that way. That's, that's what's being said there, right? It, it it, it is what's being said, and then it also, what follows next is, you also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning, saying, 
and you understand what I've been teaching. You've witnessed what I've been teaching. You have special knowledge that other people don't have. So when this comes to you, this advocate comes to you, when this Holy Spirit comes to you, you have the responsibility of telling people that sometimes when they see the butterfly or the bird, that that in fact is the advocate, that that is the Holy Spirit, that that is me coming to you. And so I think that's how we are supposed to read this. I think that's what Jesus is saying is that it's coming from God and I'm passing it on to you who has special knowledge, who has special experience, and you have a job to make sure you're sharing that with others. Yeah, this is, I mean, if this is true, this influences everything. <laughs> if this is true, this influences everything from the time we wake up in the morning till the time we go to sleep and through our sleep at night. Um, now, I'm trying to remember uh, which theologian said this, but I remember reading in a book of essays on theological thought, someone saying that this is like you're living in the midst of a world at war and someone um, who is with you out of your community or on your side comes to you and says, I'm getting ready to leave and you won't see me, you know, for a while, but I am still going to be communicating with you. I'll be communicating with you through these messages. And this is how you'll know that the messages are for me. There'll be something in the messages that confirm for you that it's from me, something that only I could be bringing you in the message. That's how you know. The messages themselves will authenticate that it's from me. And I will continue to give you truth and connection that way. Don't lose faith. I'll be still connected with you. That's what it's like, isn't it? In what? other words, there's... Go ahead. And I was going to say, I mean, that's what happens with preaching, right, John? I mean, I think that we sort of in some ways have the, the, uh, the boldness and audacity to stand up on Sunday mornings and to preach. And we, we do that with humility and we do that with faith. We do that with a great deal of prayer and we do that with study and intentionality. Um, and we, we craft the message that we feel is coming from the scriptures and that will be applicable to uh, the community in a given time and in a given place but by the same token i mean we also do it trusting that the holy spirit is going to say to the community what the holy spirit needs to say um and and preachers will often um you know preface the sermon with a prayer that to, to in some ways or in some usage of words um we say in that prayer you know, that, that, that people would, that, you know, we ask the Holy Spirit to silence within us any word but thine own, meaning kind of no matter what words come out of my mouth, that the people receive the word that, that they need to hear. Um, and, and I've had, I certainly have had the experience of having preached a sermon and hearing back from people the word that they have heard. And I, and I've, and it's given me pause and I've thought, did I say that? <laughs> right. I mean, and I think that that's part of the work of the spirit. Um, it's the spirit's work in and through the people who are receiving the words that I say, which may or may not have been in, intentionally what I had thought I was saying. <laughs> if, that muddy, if that muddiness makes any sense at all. But I think yeah. that's part of the gift of the spirit. I, I, I'm leaning you over this because I think it, it, it's where the really important part is. The rest of it, I think, flows out of this in the text. And I, you know, I, the, to, um, to try to find parallels in human experience. And, and I appreciate the work you all have done. I was going to bring two. There's something in this that feels familiar to me in the way in which a doctor, a physician, especially a surgeon, We'll talk to a patient before surgery. We're going to operate, you know, on you tomorrow, and we're going to put a valve in your heart. We'll be putting you under anesthesia, but we'll be working on you while you're under. We'll do the best we can. We'll be caring of you. We've done this before. 
When you go under, know that, and family members will say it too, we'll be in the waiting room praying for you, we'll be there, and, and, and um, we'll be working for you, you know, so you have to, you're put in the position of trusting that they are with you. And indeed, what's different about that experience is that typically they do come out of the anesthesia and you are there and they can say it did happen. There's, a, there's an absent but present, you know, parallel in that. That isn't perfectly analogous to this, but it's within human experience. Another one would be when parents say to children going to school, how, how um, terrifying that is. I'm going to take you to the preschool. I'll go in with you. Then you're going to stay with the teacher and I'll leave, but I'll come back. I'll come back at noon and get you. I'll be there for you. And children, you know, in their anxiety, burst into tears. That is authentic fear until they've learned through experience. You know, mama was there and came back for me. Daddy did come back for me. And then they're able to approach it with courage. But there's a promise Uh Although um, they don't promise that they can be with us. You know, the surgeon can, but the uh, parents don't promise that they're with you, but that they're placing you in the care of someone else whom they trust, a teacher in that respect. Jesus here, you know, says, he, he names this helpful presence when the advocate comes, um, who I'll send to you, I mean, that's a positive description, and it's an active description. The advocate, you know, is somebody who's working for you, and he's also, the advocate is also someone who's positively engaged uh, for you on your behalf, uh, and it comes from the Father and is associated with truth, truthfulness, and will bear its own testifying, and it will bring you into testifying also because you've been there from the beginning. And then he goes on to say in verse one, now I've said, I've said this thing to you to keep you from stumbling. And then he talks about ordeal that's coming. This is going to be hard. But he says, I've said these things to you to keep you from stumbling because without me telling you this, you'd stumble. You'd stumble. And they, I, this has in it the sense of the promise that he will be with us again, even on the other side of this gift of the spirit like the parents talking to the children at the preschool. The, and then the ordeal that, that comes, that he speaks of, they, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that by doing so, they're offering worship to God. They'll do this because they haven't known the Father or of me. And then verse four, but I've said these things to you so that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. And that's meant to you know, lower their anxiety, their fear in the midst of ordeal like this. And then he goes on, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you in person. But now that you're going into this moment, I won't be with you. Now I'm telling, verse five, but now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks, where are you going? And uh, that's an interesting turn here. But he goes on to say, I'm telling you this now because sorrow is filling your hearts. But I, I tell you, and this sounds very parental for, for, to me, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. <laughs> you know, this is for your own good. This is for your best interest so that the advocate will come to you. It's good that you go off to school, you'll grow, you're mature, you know, but the promise from Jesus here is, plus you'll pick up this relationship with the advocate. I mean, this to me seems like the promise impacts us sort of every minute you know, of our continuing Christian lives. Uh, and it's, it's an uh, audacious assertion that Jesus himself is going to be with us through the expression of the Spirit. I, I think, too, the one of the things that just stands out to me in this passage is the fact that the disciples are at a point of being with Christ, literally, and yet there's not a full enough understanding until the spirit comes. Um, you, you quoted from one, I have said these things to you to keep you from stumbling. Um, but there's also in verse 12, uh, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And I, I just think about that. This is, 
this is Christ speaking to the disciples, but it's Christ speaking to each and every age throughout the church because the work of the Spirit is constantly anew, not redisclosing the revelation of Jesus Christ, but reinterpreting what Christ means to each generation, each age, each place. And so I, 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 I think one, it's just kind of breathtaking that when Christ is in their own presence, they can't fully understand who Christ is until the spirit comes, but also the, the power of, of the spirit to kind of reinterpret to us again and again, um, who Christ is uh, and what that revelation means to us in this day and age, and therefore empowering us to then testify. Hey, we'll say something a little bit more about how that empowers us to testify. There's a uh, raccoon walking around in my front yard right now. Um, so I'm really? <laughs> just kind of yeah. taken aback. <laughs> just walking creation. around. It's on my neighbor's uh, patio now. Is that raccoon testifying? I it might be. It might be. Yeah. It might be a messenger, an angel. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. What what did you ask? How does that uh, you know empower us to testify? You ended by saying therefore empowering us to testify. Yeah. So so I I, I think it empowers us because it. You, you know this text is often used on Trinity Sunday, and I think one of the reasons it's used then. Um, is because of the relational nature of the text, the, you know, exemplified in the Trinity, but what we as believers are drawn into. And I think what's happening here is when we uh, come into contact with the Spirit, the Spirit uh, discloses the revelation of Christ in a way we can't fully understand on, on our own. And, and through that disclosure, through that um, revealing, whatever you want to call it, our, our, our faith is not only deepened, but emboldened to go out and share the good news with those we come in contact with. It's like um, a message has been given to us, and in the giving of that message, we're also enabled to share it. I, I agree with what Will is saying, and, and, and I think the emphasis here is that I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them uh, now, saying, I taught you a whole bunch of stuff, but then the language goes on to say um, uh, 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 that, that the Spirit will continue to talk to you over time. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, or he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And those things that are to come is sort of the rest of the story, the way we live our lives, what we're going to encounter as we live our lives, what our needs are in the future that are different than we can even anticipate right now. And even in those situations, when the pandemic hits, uh, I'm still gonna be with you as the Holy Spirit and I'm still going to guide you, and I'm still going to be there with you, and I'm still going to make sure you need to, you need, you hear the things you need to hear. And so I think that it's very reassuring words. And, and not to push you on that, Mike, um, but because I need to keep unpacking this, why is that, how is it reassuring? That there's just not, it's just not a matter of telling you what you need to know today, that it doesn't end at some point, that it's not a finite thing, that it's a continuing thing, that as your needs change, as your needs become greater, as you encounter things you never anticipated encountering before, when you need to know that God is there at scary times in the future that you never even anticipated were going to be scary, God still is going to be with you. And, and so when you come upon those things in life that seem overwhelming, un, you're unable, you feel unable to cope with it. Uh, it's that reminder, just stop a second and breathe and, and let the Holy Spirit be known in your life. And seek it, uh, pray for it, ask for it, look for it. Um, but at the same time, know that the Holy Spirit is still going to be with you, that God is still going to be with you. And, and that's, that's how I read it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's helpful. It's the promise of continuing presence. 
very direct continuing presence. Yeah, although mitigated to us in a form that is different than his human physical body presence. Mitigated to us in a spirit, the spirit of truth. And, and making itself known through its testifying in some way to him, authenticating itself by its own confirmation in some way that we still have to experience that it is Jesus himself. I, there's a line, there's some lines here um, that I find um, a little different in tone than what the whole reading might give. And that's, um, it's like starting with verse five. Um, but now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Does that have a little bit of a sense of rebuke to you? Um, as if he's saying, why don't some of you ask me where I'm going, you know? Or, or is he um, saying there, uh, you know, you all aren't able to be um, comprehending enough to ask me where I'm going. And then in verse six, a similar thing, because I, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Um, as if, you know, I said these things to you, sorrow fills your heart. Sorrow shouldn't fill your hearts. Because all you could hear was that I was going. And that sorrow was keeping you from hearing that I will still be uh, with you. Verse 7, nevertheless, which I experience is a strong word. I tell you the truth. I know you're sad about this, but I'm telling you to the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. And then he goes on this whole riff towards the world. And when he comes, verse 8, when he comes, he will prove the world wrong, wrong about sin, about righteousness, about judgment, uh, uh, and he lists why they're wrong. In other words, when I read it a second time, I hear not just this comforting, assuring words of his continuing presence, but a kind of a shaking of his head and, and a rebuke of the world that's just wrong about so many things. And that's not something, you know, I typically interpret out of this, but I'm thinking it's there. How about you all? I... I I, I can see how that that reading comes, but I do, you know, the the end of the 13th chapter, Peter asked him explicitly, where are you going? Um, so I wonder if it's in reference to that. It's like, you've already asked me that. We don't need to go over that again. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that the rebuke isn't there, but I, at least for that, that com came to mind. Yeah, I'm not sure. What to, go ahead, Mike. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just saying I'm not sure what to do with the rebuke if it's there, because uh, I usually don't hear it. I usually hear in this comfort, but you know, pulling out those sentences, I sort of pick up even in his comfort, like the parent who's saying, "I told you, it's going to be fine." <laughs> you know, the exasperation. It's I'm going to be with you. You're not going to be alone. I will catch you. <laughs> there, there is that relationship throughout though with with christ and the disciples this almost parent ch ch child relationship yeah yep. you know it's kind of exasperation of repeating themselves and all that kind of stuff yep. i i always kind of like grouchy jesus um it, because i because i think it it does speak to relationship it's it's showing jesus talking to his disciples in a way that's demonstrating his understanding. It's the way that people are in a relationship with one another, might talk to each other, and the world standing on the outside thinks, wow, they're really mad at each other. And, and the, the truth is they're not mad at each other. They're just talking to each other the way they talk to each other, with, with, with understanding, it, with, with you know, direct language and love. And so you know, I always kind of like that. And to me, it always suggests uh, a close relationship that says that Jesus can talk to his disciples in a way that demonstrates he does know them, he does love them, and he's talking to them honestly. That's helpful. Very helpful. The intimacy of confident friendship, the intimacy of family talk. Yep.
How about, let me ask you all, as we move towards the end of time uh, that we have for this passage, this mysterious passage, this comforting passage, this passage where Jesus is speaking of something they have not experienced, and maybe we've experienced it and maybe not. Um, verse 15, all that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What, what does that mean? And I, and I don't mean to ask, you know, such a general question, you can answer it, but all that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Just a simple kind of rephrasing of that to make it intelligible. All the Father has is mine. It's, you would expect that to go the other way, right? All that Jesus has is the Father. Don't we think of the Father as the greater power? Um, and Jesus says, all that the Father has is mine. And it's for that reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Help me make that intelligible. Well, the the Greek, the, the NASB translates it as disclose. And I think um, the Greek is more to announce, to make known. Uh, and so I, I find that helpful just alone instead of declare that, that language of disclose or make known. Um, I, 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 I don't know if I could translate it. Uh, it, it it's, a, it's a kind of mysterious passage and, and I get the sense that the, the, spirit, the spirit is future oriented in this passage, will guide will speak, um, uh, will declare. And, and I think what's happening here is that the, the disciples are being invited into something much broader than they understand in the moment. And I think this passage is speaking to that and that there is so much more for you to know, to understand, to take part in, and that, that lies ahead. And there's this expansiveness when I read this of creation in and of itself, right? Just the entirety of creation is the father's and is Christ. And we are in some way brought into that. Um, that I, I just can't get away from the relationality of this. And when I think about that, I think about we become responsible for more. That's, that's the troubling part of Pentecost and of the Holy Spirit is more is disclosed, but it's like to whom much is given, you know, there's much expected. And so when we um, are in a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, when the church comes to Pentecost, they move from this little band of scared people to the church on fire. And that comes with a great responsibility. And I think that's the same for our encounters with the Holy Spirit as well. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Friends, anything that you would add to this passage as we bring this to a close and your thoughts, comments, um, how it may travel with you this week, how it might intersect with you this week. I'll buy you a little time. I, I tend to hear this tonally, and of course I've heard this passage before, but I hear it tonally in gentle tones that are reassuring. But when I look at the content at a deeper level, I begin to hear in it exhortation. You know, like it moves from sort of the quiet, comforting music of a choir with taze tones at Vespers to more like Henry V in uh, a Shakespearean play saying, into the breach, into the breach again, to really put it in a culturally uh, uh, you know, prevalent norm, it, it's, it begins to sound to me like William Shatner on the bridge of the enterprise, you know, and we'll boldly go where no one has ever gone before, you know, together. He's exhorting them not to lose confidence that he will be with them, even though they don't know what they're going into, into the future. <laughs> you know, <laughs> There's a tone shift in prayer and investigation on this for me. How will you all carry it this week?
I think I'm going with William Shatner. <laughs> I've read this passage lots of times before, but I agree with you on, on deeper reading. There is that element of it. Yeah. And uh, I guess I should find that to be troubling or scary, but I don't. And so I, uh, I'm glad you lifted it up the way you lifted it up. I, I just, yeah, promise and challenge both are present within this text. There is the promise that uh, we are not left, in a, uh, left alone. I will not be left alone. Um, there is the spirit and the spirit speaks truth. And yet then uh, once I hear and receive the spirit of truth, I am obligated to do something. I'm obligated to live my life reflecting that as well. And it's, you know, it's hard work discerning the voice of the spirit, uh, but that's the work that we're called to do. Since this is boundary language and pushes us to experiences that we've had, but have to work at finding language to describe, I'll, I'll leave us with two others. I talked about it being like the surgeon who speaks to the patients, you know, before the surgery, having heard surgeons do that, you know, surgeons take different tones on that. Sometimes a surgeon will be, you know, uh, very gentle, reassuring, praying sometimes with the patient, promising them that they'll be there, you know, that they will do their best work, that they're going to work to get them on the other side. Sometimes a surgeon will come in and say, we're going to beat this thing, you and me together. Sometimes a surgeon will come in like a football coach. Let's go on in there and let's kick the heck out of cancer today. You know, I've seen that happen. Or coming at you, Mike, attorneys will do the same thing. Attorneys will say to a client, and, and you certainly have tried trials, Mike, where the stakes were very high, you know, and you have to say something to a, a client, you know, whether you assure them in a comforting tone or whether you're saying to them, this is like a softball game and you were coming up the bat and they just have pulled you and they're putting me in as your pinch hitter and I'm getting ready to hit a home run or what I'm, I'm not an attorney, whatever, what, whatever you might say tonally, that's meant to give confidence to the client and encourage them with respect to what the outcome it's the unknown it's the future, but there's a confidence that, that comes out of a certainty that one knows in it. Right. Yeah. Who's praying us out. Let's pray, friends. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the many gifts and opportunities that we have in life. We especially this day lift up our thanks for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray for your presence to be known to us at times when we most need it. We pray that you will be present with others in our lives who most need it. As we pray today, we lift up those who are on each of our individual hearts and minds, People who we know have special needs this day for healing or comfort or reassurance or care. We pray for those who are victims of the pandemic and although much progress has been made and we give thanks for vaccines, we pray that you will continue to be with all who suffer from the disease and uh, those who care for them and love them. As we pray this day, we give thanks for fellowship uh, and although the fellowship of today is different than fellowship at the past, we give thanks for the opportunity to come together and to study your word and to lift it up. We pray that what we take from this place today is that which you would have us take away. And as we pray, we pray together the words we've been taught saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Followers of the way, um, we come to you from the future. Uh, we've recorded this ahead of your hearing it. Our promise is that we continue to pray for you as you hear this recording. And that while you may not um, see us in person, we're thinking of you, we're pulling for you, we're traveling towards Pentecost together. It'll be a wonderful thing when the spirit falls upon us. We hope we see you next week to talk about what that experience was.
The peace of Christ be with you.